living here in the desert, we're very much aware of the importance of water. You know, 90% of our water in the Las Vegas Valley comes from Lake Mead, which is located just a few miles east of the city of Las Vegas. It's on the Nevada-Arizona border. Lake Mead is a reservoir that is formed by the Hoover Dam on the Colorado River, and it was built in the 1930s. But today, Lake Mead is at the lowest level it has ever been. As Lake Mead dries up, it is becoming one of the nation's most serious crises, and yet you hear very little about it. Over 25 million people depend on the water from Lake Mead, as well as the agriculture for many states. And probably as the water is rationed and we see water shortages, perhaps in our future, the first thing that will be shut down is farms, agriculture, food. That may well come to pass. The electric power produced by the Hoover Dam is down 25% and decreasing due to low water. That means uh, electrical blackouts. That means restrictions on the use of electricity, perhaps in the years to come. And you don't hear very much about that. But it's an ongoing crisis that's worsening because water, hear me church, Water is critical to life. 75% of the Earth's surface is covered with water. 70% of an adult's body is water. 85% of an adult's brain is water. Now, a person can live without food for a month or so, but you can barely make a week without water, because water is critical to life. Water is critical today, and water was critical in the time of Jesus as well, because if, if rain did not come to the Levant, that area sometimes called Palestine, the Middle East, the Levant, if water did not come in late fall and during the winter, there would be no crops the following year. No crops meant famine and death for the entire region. Water is critical to life. No water, no life. The Bible speaks to the importance of water as water is perhaps the most often used metaphor in all of the imagery of Scripture. Water is spoken of 722 times in the Bible. That's more than prayer, more than faith, more than worship, more than heaven, more than many other important uh, topics. The Bible talks about water. So today, we're going to talk about the biblical imagery of water, and specifically in relation to Jesus' teaching at the Feast of Tabernacles in the Gospel of John, chapter 7. Water imagery is extremely important in the writings of John, the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and the Book of Revelation. But let's seek to understand the significance of water imagery for us as the followers of Jesus today. We'll get a little bit of background before we get into the scripture. We have been for several weeks now, if you've noticed, in John chapter 6. A lot of things have happened in John chapter 6. We didn't even finish the whole chapter. And of course, a lot of the teaching of John chapter 6 is about bread. And the context and the background to the chapter is Passover, which comes in the spring of the year. Now we're going to move ahead to John chapter 7. And the time of the year changes from the spring and Passover to the late summer, early fall and the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles are sometimes called uh, the Feast of Booths. You know what a tabernacle is? It literally means a tent. 
a temporary dwelling, a booth, a hut. In the Hebrew, it's called Sukkot. And it means a temporary dwelling. And the festival reminded Israel as they celebrated each year of the fact that when God brought them out of the land of Egypt, they lived in temporary dwellings for 40 years. And God did not want them to forget that, so annually they celebrated that festival to commemorate living in temporary dwellings when they came out of Egypt. All right, let's look at John chapter 7. In just a few verses I'm going to highlight here. First of all, John chapter 7, verse 2. John 7, verse 2. And John writes, Now the Jewish festival of booths was near. So that sets the time. Late uh, summer, early autumn. In fact, uh, the Feast of Booths will be coming up in September, just a few weeks from right now. It will be celebrated by some of the Jewish people around the world. Now notice that John calls it the Jewish Feast of Booths. Why does he do that? Well, you may remember that John is writing in the 90s AD in Asia to Gentile Christians who perhaps don't know a whole lot about the Jewish festivals, though it's important to know something about them to understand the backdrop of John's writings. But they, for John, were the Jewish festival. Let's skip down to verse 14. John 7, verse 14. Because Jesus at first told his brothers he wasn't going up to the feast at Jerusalem. But then later he decided to go. So in John chapter 7, verse 14, we read about the middle of the festival. Everybody remember how long the festival lasted? Seven days. Very good, Bible students. The festival lasted seven days. So about the middle of the festival, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And by going up, he went from, from Galilee, Capernaum, up, because Jerusalem is on a hill. So you always go up to Jerusalem. So he went up to the festival about the middle of it. So about the middle of the festival, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. We we'll skip down to verse 37, John 7, 37. On the last day of the festival, what festival? Booths, Jewish festival, booths, tabernacles on the last day, which would be which day? Hint? Seventh? You're pretty sharp. On the last day of the festival of booths, seventh day, called the great, that's what it literally says, the great. Why was it called the great? Well, because of all the ceremonies that happened on the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which we'll read about in a few minutes. But it was music, even uh, as some writers say, dancing, festivities, uh, processions, uh, waving of branches. Uh, the seventh day was uh, the big celebration of the festival, and they call it the last great day. Now, some think that was the eighth day, which is a separate festival, but I'm saying that it's much more likely talking about the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Because the eighth day was the Sabbath. You didn't do anything. I mean, you rested. <laughs> you worshiped. But there are none of the great ceremonies, none of that happened on. So he's talking here probably about the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So on the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, where? Don't you wish sometimes the Bible writers would have given us a few more details? Uh, things that they don't think were important, we might think are important. Where? Where was Jesus standing? Well, I'm going to make a suggestion for you. We're going to read about a ceremony that happened throughout the Feast of Tabernacles, but especially on the seventh day. And that is the water pouring ceremony. Water was poured out. I'm going to suggest that that's where Jesus was standing, along with all the crowds, watching the water pouring ceremony. And so Jesus was standing there with everyone else at that time. While Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me. 
Now, wouldn't that kind of make sense and attract attention? I mean, you're just watching all this water being poured out, and after it's all poured out, he says, if anyone is thirsty, after watching all this water being poured out down the drain, come to me. Verse 38, and let one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart, or it, some manuscripts say out of Jesus' heart, but it, both in Jesus' heart and the believer's heart, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now what in the world is that talking about? Jesus says, if anybody's thirsty, come to me and drink, and out of their heart, that's uh, the NIV translation, the literal Greek there is belly. Out of my belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, today we might say out of my gut, <laughs> uh, but that doesn't sound very literary or poetic. So heart uh, sounds better, but the meaning, the imagery is the same. Out of the seat of my emotions, out of my innermost being, as some translations have. No, it's literally belly. Now keep that in mind. It's literally out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. But out of my, my innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Now what in the world is Jesus saying? What are the crowds to make of this enigmatic statement that to come to him and drink and if they drink from him then out of their bellies will flow rivers of living water what what is he talking about verse 39 now he said this about the spirit he's talking about the spirit Wow. Okay. Now what do we learn from that? Well, what is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit in Scripture? There are a number of them. But here Jesus specifically talks about water. Living water. Flowing water. Rushing fresh water is like the Holy Spirit. It's a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. Now he said this about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive, for as yet there was no Spirit. Now it doesn't mean no Spirit existed. It means for as yet no Spirit had been given. People had not yet really received the experience of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit yet. Because Jesus was not yet glorified. Do you understand what glorified means? When Jesus was resurrected, he came forth bodily. His human body came forth from the grave, from the tomb. But it was a glorified human body. Now, that's, that's difficult for us to get around. I, I'm always amazed, you know, the Apostle Paul tries to explain that one time. And he says, and so there are the terrestrial bodies, and there are the celestial bodies, and there's a spiritual body. And when a person comes forth, there, and then he's kind of like, uh, never mind. <laughs> this is complicated. It's difficult for, what is a glorified body? It's a body. It's a physical body that's been glorified. And that means it's no longer bound by some things of time and space. And yet Jesus, when he was resurrected and glorified, you know, he ate food. He sat down and had a meal. He talked. He entered a room. He was present. And yet he was glorified. How does Jesus exist in heaven today? In his glorified body. Jesus is still in a body. And one day when we are resurrected, we will be in bodies, glorified bodies. And how many times have I said that heaven is not the reward of the saved? You heard me say that? Heaven is not the reward of the saved. 
Heaven is an intermediary step to the ultimate of the reuniting of spirit and body in a glorified body. The same kind of body that Jesus had when he was resurrected. In fact, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the resurrected life of Jesus mediated to us through the Spirit. In us, those of us who believe and accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, the resurrected life of Jesus dwells. And in one day, our bodies will come forth from the grave, the tomb, from the molecules to which they've been dispersed, and we will live again in that glorified body, just as Jesus did. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. So, now this he said about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive, for as yet there was no Spirit given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. The resurrected Jesus and us by the mediation of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. All right, so what was Jesus talking about? What is living water? And how does it flow from the believer's heart? How does that happen? And what does this have to do with the Holy Spirit? And the role of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life? Let's understand. But in order to do that, we need to learn more about the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, its ceremonies, and uh, their relationship to the backdrop of the teaching of Jesus here in John chapter 7. Now I'm going to do something I don't usually do today. I'm going to read. So bear with me while I read some things. I'm going to read from uh, a very interesting book. The title of this book is uh, The Imagery of the Feast of Tabernacles in the Gospels. And you may know the author. It's me. <laughs> so, forgive me, I'm going to read from what I wrote today. This was my master's thesis at uh, Canberra School of Theology, Emory University, when I got my master's of theological studies degree. This was my thesis. So, I'm going to read from the chapter, sections from the chapter about uh, living water, the Feast of Tabernacles, in John chapter 7. So, John chapter 7, verse 37, sets the teaching of Jesus about living water on the last day, the great day of the feast. It was on this day that the festival ceremonies included a sevenfold circumambulation. That means walking around of the altar. So imagine this, if you will, the altar in the temple. And every day they come forward, but on the seventh day they walk around the altar seven times. It was a culmination of the libations, that is, water pouring, and rituals held each day of the festivals. So the Mishnah, which is the Jewish writings describing in detail these ceremonies, the Mishnah describes the water drawing and libation ceremony as the first common rite for each day of the Feast of Tabernacles and as one of the most important parts of the temple liturgy. The water ceremony began when a priest descending to the pool of Siloam, accompanied by a group of faithful worshipers, and a band of flutists, or flautists, if you will, but music. Okay, imagine this. This is a parade from the temple to the Pool of Siloam, a parade with music. Also, the priests can gather water from the Pool of Siloam to bring back to the temple. The entire procession then returned to the temple through, guess which gate they came through when they came back? There were 12 gates. Guess which gate they came through when they came back to the temple? The water gate. Okay. The water gate. How do you think it got its name? It was the water gate. So they came back to the temple through the water gate. The priest entered the temple area accompanied by the blowing of trumpets and went to the southern side of the altar. 
He placed two silver basins on each side of the altar. Can you imagine this? You know what the altar looks like. Basically a large trunk, the altar. But on the two sides of the altar, they placed silver bowls. And they poured wine into one bowl on one side. Wine. Hmm, wine. What does wine kind of symbolize? Let's see, we're going to take wine, or grape juice, if you will, the fruit of the vine today, as a part of what? Communion. Communion. And why do we do that? What does it picture? The blood of Jesus. Hmm. So they're going to pour wine in one bowl on one side of the altar. And water from the pool of Siloam on the west side. Wine on the east. Water from the pool of Siloam on the west side of the altar. Tubes running from the bowls, the water and the wine, carried the liquids to the base of the altar. The water pouring was accompanied by the playing of flutes and by the voices of worshipers chanting the words, O Lord, save us now, we beseech you. Hoshana, Hosanna, Hosanna. That's, that's what this means. That's what they were singing. O Lord, save us now, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, send us prosperity. Now, how were they going to get prosperity? Water. Crops, agriculture. They needed water for prosperity. Lord, send us prosperity. On the seventh day, the great day of the feast, they circled the altar seven times. That's why the seventh day came to be called Hoshana Rabbah. The Lord, now we beseech you, we supplicate before you, we beg of you. And the cry, Hosanna, which means Save, save us now. Hosanna was repeated seven times on this occasion. The water ceremony appears to have been rooted in the agricultural character of the feast. The rabbis regarded the water libation performed at the Feast of Tabernacles as a ceremony, listen to this, with the aim of producing rain. Why did they pour the water out at the altar and saying, save us now, we beseech you, O Lord. It was a supplication for water, for rain. Rain is essential to the growing of crops, and thus to prosperity and even to life itself. Judea was a land subject to long, dry summers. Its inhabitants, who were dependent upon rainfall for their crops, prized rain greatly, and anxiously awaited the end of summer and the beginning of the rainy season. The coming of rain would make possible the new agricultural season. Rain was seen as a blessing from God and drought as a punishment for sin. Could that be why Lake Mead is drying up? No, just a thought. Just a thought. You know, I'm not judgmental. I condemn people who are judgmental. <laughs> Since the Jews believed that they were dependent upon God for rain, they developed a ceremony in which they called upon their God to provide water from heaven for their crops. The water libation ceremony that developed was to be performed at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles because the feast occurred at approximately the end of the agricultural year and marked the beginning of the season for rain. So after the pilgrims went home from the Feast of Tabernacles, the thing they looked for to start, hopefully soon, would be rain. At least as early as the time of the writing of Zechariah 14, connection appears between rain and the worship of God at the Feast of Tabernacles. It does appear that already a purpose of the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles was to assure the fall of rain. 
According to the Mishnah, it was the Feast of Tabernacles that the world would be judged as to whether to receive rain and thus would be judged as a matter of life and death upon the nation. In order to understand the symbolism involved in the water libation, it's helpful to understand the treatment of rain and water in some of the Jewish cosmology of the time. All right, now this gets really sexy. So this is R-rated material now. I just want to warn you. It's R-rated material coming up here. Oh, wait. I sure got a lot of interest all of a sudden. All right. Here comes some R-rated material. Prior to and during the New Testament period, some traditions held that God had separated the male waters from the female waters in the days of creation. The upper waters were viewed as male waters in the sky were male and the earth as well as the lower waters which are in it were viewed as female water in the sky male water on the earth female some rabbis compared the falling of rain to sexual intercourse between a man and a woman both sets could be understood to both acts could be understood to what? Engender life. The act of procreation was also seen by some in the ritual of the water libation that was performed at the Feast of Tabernacles. The water from Siloam that was poured out at the altar during the Tabernacles water ceremony was pictured by tradition as flowing down through long tubes or shafts and coming out at the end. I told you this is not a reading material right here. <laughs> Which contained the uh, cosmic waters of chaos. And thus the act of water libation was seen by some as representing the copulation of the upper and lower waters. The lower waters of Tihom, the deep as it's often called, were thought to gather under the foundation stone of the earth that rests at the center of the cosmos called the navel and the belly of the earth. Where did the waters, where are they going to come out? They're going to come out from the navel, the belly of the earth. Out of the belly shall flow rivers of living water. The navel or belly of the earth was pictured as beneath the temple at the place of the altar. Do you get the picture here? Let's see if I can. You've got the altar. You've got wine on one side, water on the other. And as they're pouring them out, they go through long tubes underneath the altar and into the earth to do what? Well, to stimulate the female waters of the earth and to mix together so that the waters below the earth shall rise up through the navel at the belly of the earth beneath the altar. And when they rise up to heaven and meet the waters there, what's going to happen? It's going to rain. And that's the idea. So do you begin to get the imagery of what Jesus was saying with, with the Holy Spirit when it comes into you? It, it'll be like rivers of living water flowing out of your belly. What he's saying is it's like the water libation ceremony at the feast. It'll bring rain. And what does rain bring? Rain brings a harvest. Rain brings prosperity. Rain brings life. And as long as you have rain, you will have life. The saying, John 7.37, which we just read, has been said in the text of the fourth gospel in a certain context. It is said in the context of the temple, that's where Jesus was standing, 
during the Feast of Tabernacles. The author of the fourth gospel wants his readers to understand the saying in association with this place and this festival. Thus, the allusion to water should be understood in relation to water in the temple and its association with the Feast of Tabernacles. What did it all mean? Well, according to Jewish understanding of the day, when the Messiah comes, there is the promise of the pouring out of a spirit from God. If you listen to some of the scriptures that were read, you heard the comparison of water being poured out and the Holy Spirit coming. Speaking of being poured out, how is the Holy Spirit coming upon us usually pictured? What's the metaphor used of the Holy Spirit coming upon someone? The Holy Spirit is poured out. That's why that metaphor is so often used of the Holy Spirit being poured out. So when the Messiah comes, there's a promise of a pouring out of the Spirit from God, a celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles, and a promise of living water. So, when John, Zechariah 9-14 through 14 was read through the context of Jesus' teaching in John 7, the readers of the fourth gospel could draw no other conclusion other than that Jesus was the Messiah. That was clear and obvious. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one the prophet said would make water pour forth. And that water would be the Holy Spirit. Now, I mentioned it's also in Revelation. There's a parallel between Revelation 22:17. Revelation 21 and John 7, 38, the scripture we just read. Listen to this. This is Revelation 22, 17. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take of the water of life as a gift. That's from the book of Revelation. John 7, 38, which we just read. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let the one who believes in me drink. The parallel to what Jesus said on that day and what according to John, when the Lord comes in glory again, what's he going to say? Same thing. Revelation 22, verse 1. The river of the water of life. Wish we could have sing that song today. I'd sing it for you right now, but uh, I'll spare you. The river of life. The river of life keeps going. The river of life keeps flowing. The river of life. The river of the water of life flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. John 7, 38. From within him shall flow rivers of living water. Meaning from Jesus and from the believer. Okay, here's more. Another background of John's scripture citation may be seen of the various descriptions of the rock from which water flowed during the days of ancient Israel's wilderness wanderings. The Feast of Tabernacles were considered to be a time of reflection upon the occurrences of the wilderness tradition. Remember, they lived in temporary dwellings while they roamed in the wilderness. And texts in the Hebrew scriptures, especially in the Psalms, that depict the water from the rock. Remember that? The water from the rock and the wilderness can be seen to parallel the wording of John 7 through 38, which we just read. So we've got another connection with what? Water flowing from a rock. Does anybody remember what Paul said about who that rock was? And Paul said, and that rock was... Jesus Christ, yes. Oh, the rock. Jesus. Water flowing from the rock. Water flowing from Jesus. Water represents the Holy Spirit. Where does the Holy Spirit come from? Through Jesus.
In Psalm 114, it tells how God turned the rock into a spring of water. And one of the psalms sung by the festival participants during the daily processions of the Feast of Tabernacles. And there are many other scriptures that talk about water from the rock. In the Mishnah, again, the wilderness water miracle is interpreted typologically as a forerunner of the water ceremony at the Feast of Tabernacles. In order to accomplish this thematic connection, the scripture, uh, descriptions are reconstructed. The gushing from the rock is described as becoming a great river that flows out and brings life. John, in these verses, is also presenting Jesus as the rock from which the living water flows, just as it did in the wilderness, gushing forth into a river of life. The background of the expression from his belly is the idea of a cavity in the temple rock out of which water flows in response to the water pouring ceremony of the feast. John then compares this cavity to the cavity in the side of Jesus when the Roman centurion spear pierced his side. All right, church, here you go. Bible students, stay with me. When the spear pierced the side of Jesus, out of his side flowed water, living water, and blood. Out of the rock was pierced, and out of his side flowed water and blood, symbolized by wine. So the water pouring ceremony, the rock in the wilderness, and why Jesus on the cross, according to John, had water and blood flow out. Now, if you read some commentaries, they go, oh, well, is it, uh, medically, we've never heard of this such thing, but possibly, water, oh, it's imagery. He's not trying to give you some a physician's diagnosis or a medical examiner's opinion. He's saying, get it, get it. Out of his wounded side flowed water and blood. He is the source of the water of life. His death actually brings the river of life and it flows out of his belly. That's a whole lot of imagery packed into quite, quite a package of, of things to get your head around. But I think knowing this, I, to me, it opens up so much understanding of Scripture and what it's talking about and, and, and what it means and all the, the beautiful imagery that teaches us uh, so many lessons. So, living water in the Spirit. In John 7, 39 identified the living water in the teaching of Jesus as representing the Holy Spirit. The symbolism of water in connection with the Spirit is, is very frequent in the Hebrew Scriptures. As I said, water is a common metaphor, and the uh, most common use of the metaphor of water is the Holy Spirit. Life, life-sustaining, life-giving, Critical to life, the Holy Spirit. And the water to which the Mishnah refers when it talks about this is that water drawing libation ceremony of the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, now think about it. You pour water under the altar to get the waters to rise, to make it rain, to bring life. Jesus was crucified poured the water out along with his blood, the wine, to bring the rains. What rain did Jesus bring when he had his water libation ceremony of water and blood flowing out of his wounded side, out of the rock? What did it bring? 
the Holy Spirit, the water of life, the river of life. And in fact, the scripture that was read earlier, with joy you shall draw water out of the wells of salvation, was quoted and sung as they came back from the pool of Siloam the water of life. So when the invitation of Jesus, come and drink, which parallels Isaiah 55, verse 1, is applied to this, you know what it implies? That the promise is now fulfilled. All the promises that we read in those scriptures in Isaiah about living waters and water in the wilderness and, you know, there will be life and there will be trees and there will be plants and the, uh, people will rejoice and, and uh, water to a thirsty soul and I will pour water upon my people. That was all fulfilled in the life of Jesus. He fulfilled all of those scriptures. All of those scriptures that you read in the Old Testament talking about water and rain are fulfilled in Jesus. They're all talking about him and what he did. And that's the meaning behind it. In the fourth gospel, living water is a present reality because it's identified with the Spirit. Because water was so often represented in Jewish thought, the prophetic promises of living water are interpreted as more than just a literal spring or river. It is interpreted as a promise of the end time, of the Messianic age, of the coming of the Spirit upon all people, and the Spirit's presence and fullness in the Messianic age. Thus, the things that people once believed would happen only at the world's end had already come to pass in Jesus at that time. That's a lot to think about. But let's try to summarize. What's living water? Physically, living water is fresh, flowing, running water. And it's used as a metaphor or image for the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, think about the comparison of the metaphor. For example, we talked about Lake Mead. We talked about the Colorado River. The flowing of the Colorado River formed the Grand Canyon. If you've never seen the Grand Canyon, drive a few miles and take a look at it. That's pretty impressive. And what created that canyon? Running water. What can running water do? Well, if running water runs long enough, it makes a grand canyon. That's what it does. And that water provides electricity, food, and life for us and for multiple states. Flowing water is powerful. Have you ever seen the floods? Maybe we talk about floods and they think sometimes water right. Have you ever, floods come in and, and waves and rushes and cars are thrown about and buildings crumble. The power of moving water is incredible. Flowing water is powerful. It's also transformative. Changes things. Everything it touches transform. Living water is life-giving and life-sustaining. So is the Holy Spirit. Flowing water refreshes, cleanses, purifies, and makes things new. So does the Holy Spirit. Now, flowing water can be resisted. It can be hindered. But it always has its way in the end. So is the Holy Spirit. Flowing water can be accepted, experienced, embraced, and participated with Hoover Dam to bring about so many beneficial and wonderful things. 
when you accept it and use it and participate with it, so can the Holy Spirit in our lives. Paul talked about the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts, our innermost beings, our bellies, through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit flows through the believer, from the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit, through the believer, and can touch all those around you with life-giving water to make changes in other people's lives, to invite them to come and drink and share in the water and the river of life. We want to share that water with others and invite them as Jesus did, come and drink. Water makes a difference. Water changes the world. So does the Holy Spirit. The true living water, the true living water is available from the Father through the Son, and in the Spirit. All one has to do to receive it, accept it, experience it, come to Jesus and believe in him and drink from the living water and never thirst again. For this is the water that sustains you for all eternity. Sisters and brothers, let us drink deeply of that true living water and then let it flow forth from each of us from our innermost being to touch the lives of others and to invite them to Jesus to come if any of you are thirsty come